When I was in high school, I threw shot put and discus, and we had this line judge who was one of our high school teachers, and he told me, don't get in there and practice. Just get in there and throw. He identified one of my problems as hesitation. And to this day, I try not to hesitate. Those words have really stuck with me. Today, I'm just going to get in, get behind the mic, and pump this podcast out. Hi, this is Kim Newlove, host of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. If you're new to the show, welcome. I am a pharmacist by training, but I made a career transition to voice actor and podcast host. Among other things, I narrate audiobooks for women pharmacist authors, and I provide medical narration to clients in the pharmaceutical and biotech industries. I was inspired by my nonverbal teenage son with autism to leverage my identity as a pharmacist and my speaking voice to launch my voiceover business, The Pharmacist's Voice, in 2017. My son, Craig, helped me realize the power of having a voice and using it. Each week, I alternate solo podcast episodes and interview shows. The solo shows are about some aspect of being a pharmacist, a voice actor, a pharmacist podcaster, or my career transition from pharmacist to voice actor and podcast host. And my interview shows feature a variety of people who use their voices to advocate for something, educate in some way, or entertain so that you are inspired to use your voice too. This is episode 130, and you can find the show notes with links to anything mentioned today on my website, thepharmacistvoice.com. You can also find my medical narration demo and a link to my online course, Pronounce Drug Names Like a Pro, on my website. That website, again, is thepharmacistvoice.com. Let's get this started. Happy New Year! This is the first episode of 2022. If you can't tell, I'm just a little lower in energy this week. No, I'm not sick. I'm recovering from my kids' Christmas break. It was long. It was three weeks long. In this episode, which is a solo episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about being a pharmacist, but I'm also going to talk about being a special needs parent. If you caught it in the intro there, I am the mother of a child with autism. He is 18 years old. His name is Craig. He actually inspires me to do what I do. I love my family. I have a husband and two boys, Derek and Craig, but really it's Craig who has taught me through his years of struggling as a nonverbal child with autism the power of having a voice. And during that time, just being a special needs parent, I have learned so much from others. And you're going to hear a lot of cliches in this episode, and I don't have it really well planned out, but I'm going to start with a story. And it's a story that you as a pharmacist can learn from, but it's something that I kind of learned as a special needs parent. Now, what I want to talk about today is the story of one plus one equals four, what pharmacists can learn from Belgian draft horses, and there will be some other stories in this episode too. What is this story about Belgian draft horses, you may be wondering? Well, it is truly the story of one plus one equals four. If you've never heard this story, there are variations of it all over the internet. I've been wanting to tell this story for a long time. When I was a kid, if you can imagine this, I was sitting in church. No, this is not a religious story. This is just a story. I'm sitting on a pew in church. The pastor's right in front of me. I'm a kid, right? I'm probably taking sermon notes. I'm probably 12 or 13 years old. I'm in, you know, that time of my life where I'm supposed to be listening very intentionally. I hear the story come up, the story of one plus one equals four, although he didn't label it that way. That is just my pet name for this story. The pastor's talking about these Belgian draft horses. I grew up out in the country. I know what a Belgian draft horse is, but for anybody listening who doesn't, it's a big horse. Lots of muscles, fairly tall, but if you can just imagine the type of horse that can pull a wagon, that's your Belgian draft horse. 
A Belgian draft horse can pull a lot of weight. You often see them in Amish country if you've ever driven through. They do things old school. They don't use tractors. This Belgian draft horse will be pulling a wagon, often a wagon that has straw or hay on it. So get your theater of the mind going, folks. I want you to imagine this horse pulling a wagon with hay or straw on it. And as they go through the field, more and more is put on. Now, this Belgian draft horse can pull probably 8,000 pounds. That's the rumor anyways. A Belgian draft horse, just one, can pull 8,000 pounds. Just imagine this field. There's more than one farmer in it. There's a Belgian draft horse on the south side. There's a Belgian draft horse on the north side. Each of them is pulling a wagon, 8,000 pounds each, right? The farmers, they get smart. They decide, let's join forces. Let's have the horses work together. They work together. The north side of the field, the south side of the field, they're all getting cleared, hay, straw, whatever's in there. These Belgian draft horses are working like crazy. Now, just doing simple math, you would think that the Belgian draft horses as a team could pull 8,000 pounds plus 8,000 pounds equals 16,000 pounds, right? I would imagine so too. As the story was told by my pastor, however, if you put these two horses together, even though they've never worked together, they can actually pull 24,000 pounds. That's a big wagon with a lot of hay or straw on it, right? These horses are working together, pulling a ton. Now, if you can imagine this, if those two horses worked together every single day of their lives, they train together, they work together, they cooperate, guess how much weight they can actually pull? If you haven't guessed this from the title of the story, each horse individually can pull 8,000 pounds, but you put them together and they've trained together and worked together, they can actually pull 32,000 pounds, which is a lot. These are beasts of burden. They are meant to pull weight and they do it. We as pharmacists are not beasts of burden, but we do have burdens, right? I'm going to draw a parallel between this amazing story that as a kid really resonated and that 30 years later I still remember, and I'm going to parallel this to the pharmacy world, the pharmacy profession. In the pharmacy profession, we are often teamed with a technician, right? I'm a pharmacist no longer in practice, but I worked in community practice for many years as an intern, and then as a pharmacist, at least nine years as a licensed pharmacist. When I worked with a tech who knew me, and I knew that tech, and we both knew what we were capable of, we were a team, much like those horses. We could pull more than each of our weight as individuals, right? The parallel is that in the pharmacy world, if you're with a technician you know and trust and you work well with, you're going to pump out tons and tons of work. And then let's go ahead and draw another parallel. What if you're working with a team of pharmacists? So maybe your pharmacy is lucky enough to have more than one pharmacist on duty. If your two pharmacists work really well together, they're going to be able to pump out more work than those as individuals, okay? You stick a pharmacist in an unmanned pharmacy with no technician and no other pharmacist to support it, they're only going to be able to pull those 8,000 pounds, right? We need to set pharmacies and pharmacists up with technicians and pharmacists that we're all used to working with and trained to collaborate with, and we're going to be able to pump out so much more. What I see in this world, what my experience is, and this is going to be an unpopular opinion, pharmacists right now don't seem to have the support that they need. And that's scary. You know, it's like putting one horse out there to pull 24 or 32,000 pounds. They just can't do it. And I just wanted to put this story out there so that it gets people thinking, I need to have a team that I collaborate well with and I am trained to work with so I get the optimal out there. And I want you to know, if you're one of those pharmacists who pharmacists who's working alone because of call-offs or you have this 
revolving door of technicians or floater pharmacists coming in, I feel you. I think we are kind of like those Belgian draft horses. You can't just expect us to pull the 32,000 pounds ourselves or people or be paired up with somebody we've never worked with and be able to pull the 32,000 pounds. It's more like the 8,000 plus 8,000 equals 16,000 because we're each individually doing our best because we've never worked together. You may think, oh yeah, but you're capable of the 24,000 because, you know, you put the two together and even though they've never trained before, they can do the 24,000. Even if they can, you're really not getting their best, the team's best. So what I want to propose is that you carry this one plus one equals four concept over to your technicians that you work with, your pharmacists that you work with, carry it over to your state pharmacist associations, your national pharmacist associations. Get in the field and work with them. Train with them, collaborate with them, do your best. I know I jumped around a lot, but my hope is that you as a pharmacist or a technician will get to work on a tr- on a team every single day that you have trained and worked with and can pump out those 32,000 pounds instead of just your own personal 8,000. I hope that that makes sense and I hope that you will recognize the value of joining a pharmacist association so that your 8,000 pounds that you can pull gets joined with other people and you learn how to work together and you go to meetings together, you serve on committees together, you learn how to make a difference in your own state. And if you can do that, I challenge you to go to a national level, learn how to work with, collaborate with other people at a national level and help our profession We really need it right now. I don't usually get political, and hey, I am not trying to point fingers. It is really hard to know who the villain is in this whole situation. I know a pandemic is something that nobody could have predicted or really prepared for properly. So I want to share something that I learned as a parent of a child with a disability. There is this natural tendency as a parent of a child with a disability to act like the people trying to help us have the answer and they're just not giving it to us. I am almost embarrassed to say that, but if I really break it down and I think about the way that I have behaved at times in my life, I'm not proud of it, but I have stopped and really thought about These people that are trying to help my son, speech therapists, occupational therapists, special needs teachers, caregivers, anybody, they are just trying to help. And a lot of times we we snap at them, right? We say, you know, just make him talk. That's not exactly something that I've said, but I've wanted to say it. I've practically said it. When my son was three or four years old, the speech therapist started bringing in a communication device. And you you have no idea how badly I just wanted to say, you know, just knock it off. Just teach him how to talk with his mouth. I may have actually said those words, but <laughs> I would like to think back and, you know, think better of myself. Maybe I said something better, but essentially that's what I said. Like, why are you giving him this thing that he touches a picture and it speaks words? Just teach him how to talk with his mouth. I think at that point, I was doing what I'm trying to explain. I was basically treating the person who was trying to help my son like they had the answer and they were keeping it from me. I know this is probably not painting me in a very positive light, but if you can imagine me, I was 20 six years old, maybe 27 years old. I just wanted my career. I just wanted my life back. But yet I had to withdraw from my career and I had to drive my kid to special needs preschool and all these early intervention activities and tutoring and speech therapy and occupational therapy and learn how to do all this stuff at home. It was kind of hard not to have feelings, right? I'm a human. But I just want to draw a parallel to the pharmacy industry right now, you know, community pharmacy especially. 
there's a lot of additional pressures. And pharmacists are thinking, just get out of my way, pandemic. I just want to go back to how it was before. I just want my career. Get this other crap out of the way. And I think sometimes pharmacists right now treat people who are trying to help like they have the answer and that they are withholding it. So basically, they're demonizing their employers. Pharmacists right now are demonizing their employers. And I'm not saying that employers aren't doing the right thing. I don't know. And so I don't want to demonize anybody. Honestly, I don't want to create a conflict of interest for myself selfishly because I would love to do voiceover for any one of these pharmacy companies. And I would like to be a voice that they trust. So I want to I want to be Switzerland, okay? <laughs> I want to be impartial, okay? But what I do want to say is that pharmacists be really careful demonizing your employers. There's this whole hashtag pizza is not working thing going on right now. I like Dr. Bled Tanaway, but I just want to caution her and everybody be careful how you speak to them because I'm going to tell you another story. And this story is about holes in a fence. Once you blast those holes through a fence, you can't take them back. Now here's the story. I can't remember where I heard this, and I don't have this prepared in front of me, but this is the story. Once upon a time, there was a man who had a teenage son. The teenage son was pissed off, and he just was angry at the world, and he was yelling at his dad and treating him badly. So his dad said, all right, this has got to stop. I want you to take this box of 100 nails and this hammer, and I want you to go to our fence in the back, and I want you to blast every single one of these nails through that fence. Just tap it right in there all the way to the head. The teenage boy goes up to the fence. He starts tapping all the nails in. He's angry. He's smashing those nails in there all the way up to the head. First try, boom, boom, 100 times. The kid feels better, but then he goes back to his dad and he says, hey, dad, I'm done. The dad says, hey, go back out there. I want you to pull every single one of those nails out. I don't care how you do it. You tap it from the other side. You use the claw part of the hammer. Do what you got to do. Take those nails out. The kid goes back out there. Guess what he does? He pulls every single one of those 100 nails out. He puts them back in the container that they came in, comes back to his dad with an attitude and says, all right, I did it. What's next? The dad says, let's go look at that fence together, son. They walk out to the fence, and what do they see? They see a fence, a wooden fence, with 100 holes in it, right? And the dad goes on to say, every single one of those holes is something nasty or mean that you have said or done. And even though you may say you're sorry or realize you were wrong, they leave a mark. They leave a hole. In our lives, folks, we make choices. We do things. We say things. And even though we say we're sorry or we take them back, it leaves a hole. So I just want to caution you as a pharmacist, be careful who you point your finger at and call the villain because employers don't have the answer either. And the more holes you put in your fence, the more trauma you cause against them. And really, they don't have a solution. You think that the solution is them giving you more hours and more pharmacists and more technicians? I don't know if that's the answer. And here's the thing. We have to quit pointing fingers at each other and claiming what the answer is. I don't know if anybody really has the solution. It's not pizza. Blood did get that right. But I do think that we have to be very careful about the holes that we're punching in the fence right now. When I left community practice back in February 2011, I had stayed too long. It was not the right thing for me. I even talk about this in episode four of my podcast. There were just too many responsibilities being laid down on me. It's not that I didn't want to work. It's just enough's enough. I'm one of those people who recognizes unsafe and possibly traumatizing situations, and I walk away. It's up to you as an individual pharmacist to decide if it's time for you to walk away. Maybe it is. I will say this, though. 
There are people that have ideas, such as adding more pharmacists to the workplace, adding more technicians. I don't disagree with that. What I believe is that we need to come at the problem of overworked, burned-out pharmacists from many angles. It's not just one. You know, you add in, it's like a moving target, right? You add in more pharmacists, more technicians, properly trained technicians, so many different things that people think are the solutions, but then the target moves. It's like, what's next? Before this pandemic, pharmacists were overworked. We were understaffed. We had too many responsibilities. So just adding in the farm extra pharmacist or the extra technician is not necessarily the solution. I think that what we really need to look at is what the patient needs. And when I say we, I mean us and whoever's employing us. We need to make sure that we are doing the right things for our patients. We collectively, we the people who are pulling the wagon together, need to do the right thing for the patient. Knowing what that right thing to do is hard. I will admit that I do not have all the answers. I think that certainly adding more pharmacists and more well-trained technicians are certainly part of the solution, but I do think that we can't just throw these solutions in employers' faces and expect them to accept them. I think that knowledge of any value cannot be given. It has to be sought and earned. That is actually a line from a children's book, a young adult book by Rick Riordan. It's called The Serpent's Shadow. It is book three in the Cain Chronicles. And let me just say that again. Knowledge of any value can't be given. It must be sought and earned. Do you agree with this or disagree? That is the question. I think that we, as pharmacists, technicians, students, we're looking for the answers. We think we have some, but you better believe that all the employers out there are also looking for answers too. The important thing is that we get hitched up and we look together and we see the same truth. When two people see the same thing differently, that's a problem. Then we're just plowing on different sides of the field. Since I'm sharing unpopular opinions today, I'm going to go ahead and share another one. And this has to do with the King Arthur story, the Camelot legend. Camelot is falling in the pharmacy world. This perfect situation that pharmacists had where we were dispensing, we were making money, we were getting respect, we were helping patients. It's falling. It's reorganizing. It's a lot like King Arthur. And his best knight, Lancelot, stole his wife and, you know, it, crap went down. King Arthur ended up finding out that it was Lancelot's son that brought balance to the kingdom. Sometimes, folks, we don't have the answer, and it's the next generation that does. You heard it here first. I don't think that the people that are in practice right now have all the answers. I think it's the next generation that's going to figure this out. I think we are going to be the workhorses that kick the can down the road, but I don't think we're going to be able to fix this. And I think that's a very normal feeling, and I think that's a very strong possibility, and I think that's okay, too. Just like Sir Lancelot couldn't save the kingdom, and Sir Galahad did, the kingdom did get saved. And that's what's really important. It doesn't matter if it's for our glory and honor, for this generation, the generation that I exist in, 20 years in. I can't fix this. It's going to take all of us working together and somebody who's going to come up after our time to fix this. And we just have to kick the can down the road for a while until it gets fixed. That's my unpopular opinion. I don't know if I'm right or not. But I just want to throw that out there so that you consider that as one possible option. Since I'm sharing unpopular opinions, I'm also going to share something else. I think that Amazon, Amazon Pharmacy, is kind of like a natural disaster. Hear me out. I am not talking crap about Amazon. Amazon got my family through a pandemic in more ways than one. <laughs> my husband worked for Amazon for 15 months and he recently left. We appreciate the paycheck and the skills that he learned, but Amazon Pharmacy 
is like a natural disaster. Think about a tornado, a hurricane, a flood, a typhoon, I don't know, all the different things that can be formed by Mother Nature and attack our world. I want to say that Amazon is something that people like to say that they saw coming. I mean, we all knew that Amazon's fantastic at distribution and they could go into the pharmacy industry, but I don't know if anybody could have seen the swirling winds when the funnel came down. What Amazon is like is kind of like this force that's going to force all of us, the survivors of the pharmacy industry, to band together to do what we need to do to survive. I have been waiting to tell this story for a very long time. I have been of the opinion that Amazon is going to happen. Amazon pharmacy is going to be a thing. I don't know how far it's going to spread. I don't know what their services are going to be, but I think that they understand what the customer wants and they are giving it to them. Why wouldn't customers and patients want to work with them? But see, here's the thing. We as pharmacists need to quit telling people that we are heroes. Did Spider-Man, Batman, Superman, did they ever go out and say, look at me, I'm the hero? No. We are the guide. We guide people. We take people who are sick and we guide them to wellness. We take people with chronic diseases and we guide them from mismanaged to managed. We make it possible for people to live longer lives and be healthier. They are the heroes. They are the ones that take our advice. We are just guiding them. I thought for years that pharmacists were the heroes. If we're truly the heroes, we're actually the guides, people. We really are. We are guiding people through their journeys, through their health journeys. We don't need to be heroes. And as soon as we stop trying to be the hero, we are going to be so much better guides. The real heroes are going to let us be their guides. I know I've been reading Story Brand by Donald Miller, but I really believe this. I didn't realize it until a couple of days ago that pharmacists are the guide, not the hero. We are the ones who come up with a plan and we call our patients to action and we tell them what's going to happen if they fail and we're going to show them what it means to have success. And afterwards, when they come to us for a refill and they end up with stable health, we assure them. You did it. You made this transformation. And as long as you get that refill every single month, you're going to be okay. You are, your disease, your chronic disease is going to be managed. So I want you to really think about reading Story Brand by Donald Miller and find out how you can be a guide. More than anything, no matter how pharmacy ends up getting healed, I want to say that it's more about getting it right instead of trying to be right, I think along the way, there will be different options about how we can fix our profession. And by fix, I mean become more patient-centered and less about, hey, I'm right. I Adding more pharmacists to my work shift was the right answer. Look at me. I'm right. I just want you to know that it's more about getting it right. It's not about being right. And I think that's really important to know the difference. Something that I've learned from being a special needs parent is that getting it right is more important than being right. I need to get things right for my son. I don't need to do it my way so that I can raise my hand and say, hey, I was right. It's more important that I get whatever it is that he needs right. I hope that makes sense. The speech therapist when my son was little said that he needed a communication device. It was hard for me to believe that. It was hard for me to believe that when he was 18 years old, he probably wouldn't be talking and we needed to get him something so he could get his wants and needs met. But I let her be right. Getting a communication device was the right thing for my son. I thought the right thing to do was just forcing her to keep doing things that would get him to talk with his mouth. I was wrong to think that. We continue to try to get him to talk. 
we have been trying those same things for years. But in addition, we added the communication device. We got it right for him. Let's get things right as pharmacists for our patients. There are pharmacists out there who are pulling their own 8,000 pounds and they're trying to be right instead of trying to get it right. Let's work together. You don't have the right to the cards that you believe you should have been dealt. You have an obligation to play the heck out of the ones that you're holding. That's what I believe as a special needs parent. That's what I believe as a pharmacist. I know that there's a lot of confusion about my company name, the pharmacist voice. I never intended to be the the voice of the profession. I still, right now, do not claim to be the pharmacist voice of the whole entire pharmacy profession. What I claim to be is a pharmacist who has really practiced and gotten her hands dirty, okay? I claim to be that pharmacist who uses her voice professionally. So please don't think that my opinions and the words that are coming out of my mouth right now are what all pharmacists believe. I am trying to inspire you as a listener to use your voice. Play your cards. Play the cards you have been dealt. You have an obligation to play the heck out of them. Just like I have. I got saddled up with a special needs kid. I did not see that coming. I did not want that. But I didn't have a right to the cards that I believed I should have been dealt. Right now, I have an obligation to play the heck out of the ones that I am holding. And I hope that you do too. Life isn't always easy. I know it's especially hard right now with the pandemic. But I want to inspire you. Play the heck out of those cards, people. Play the heck out of them. Nobody's coming to save you. Get up, be your own hero, and be your patient's guide. I'm about to cry, so I'm going to tone it down a little bit. It's a really hard time right now, folks, and I'm going to get a little emotional. The school district neighboring ours has gone to remote learning again. I just spent three weeks with pretty much no caregivers, very little help, watching my kids. Yeah, they're my kids. I get it. I have to watch them. I want to watch them. I wanted kids. Yeah, I get it. I get it. But it is hard. Anybody out there who's got kids knows. When kids come home for a break, it adds a burden. If you have a job of any sort and your kids are home for break and you have no caregivers, that's the exact situation we're talking about. It is hard. And to hear about that neighboring school district having online-only learning, it scares me. It does. This is a bad time, not just for pharmacists, but as special needs parents, because I'll tell you, the first time that the pandemic shut down the schools, March 2020, they did nothing for people with challenges. My kid cannot read, write, or speak. He doesn't use a laptop. Online learning is not an option. So me hearing that that there might be schools shut down again and we're going to be back to where we were in March 2020 scares the crap out of me. So I'll tell you what, we all have our stress. We all have our burdens. You as a pharmacist right now might be dealing with COVID testing, COVID shots, scheduling nightmares, drug shortages, technician turnover, people leaving their jobs, coming in, working with people who are just pulling their 8,000 pounds and they're not working with you so you can, as a group, pull your 32,000. I get it. The profession is hurting. Provider status is something that is not universal. Pharmacists want out. The great resignations going on. People are leaving their jobs, searching for something better. I get it. Times are tough. But if there's anything that I can do for you, I would like to inspire you to use your voice. You are a pharmacist. Nobody can take that away from you. And there is power in having a voice and using it. So use your voice. Join your state pharmacist association. Join a national pharmacist association like APHA. If you're in Ohio like me, you should really be part of the Ohio Pharmacist Association. And get your hands dirty, use your voice, and help out. Make a difference. If you are silent and you do not use your voice, what has changed?
I feel like this episode, I'm a little bit on fire. I'm kind of curious to go back and listen to it, even like a month or two from now. I've always wanted to say a lot of these things. I didn't uh, make an outline like I usually do. I didn't script anything out. This was a lot of ugly breaths and me <laughs> me talking in circles, but I hope you've gotten something out of it. If nothing else, remember that Belgian horses are Belgian horses, but I really think it applies to the pharmacy profession too. And be careful about those holes that you punch in any fence. And remember that like King Arthur and Sir Lancelot, Sir Galahad might be the solution to the problem. And let's all just kick the can down the road and do the best we can and attack this pharmacy profession issue from any angle we possibly can until Sir Galahad surfaces. And remember that line from my son's book, knowledge of any value can't be given. It must be sought and earned. Knowledge of any value can't be given. It must be sought and earned. Those are amazing words. Just remember, people aren't going to just give you the solution to your problem. You got to go out and look for it. And when you find it, make sure the people you need to work with are looking at the same thing in the same way. One of my other closing comments is that Amazon is like a natural disaster. When a natural disaster comes through, the survivors band together to do what they need to do to survive. I believe that the pharmacy profession can both survive and thrive. Let's do it. Here's another closing comment. Pharmacists really need to stop acting like somebody out there has the answer to what's wrong with the profession and punishing them for not giving it to us. That is unfair. Remember that in all things that you do, especially with patient care, seek to get it right. Don't try to be right. Here's another bit of wisdom. You don't have the right to the cards you believe you should have been dealt. You have an obligation to play the heck out of the ones you are holding. Let's do the best we can with what we have. And remember, nobody is coming to save you. Get up, be your own hero, and be your patient's guide. In closing, let's all work together. I may be a voice actor and a podcast host now, but I still have a voice and I can use it. And I know what it's like to be a pharmacist. I know the struggles. If you listen to episode four of this podcast, it's very short. I talk about how I stayed too long. Talk about what you're experiencing. It might just help our profession. Let's wrap this up. This has been a very serious episode, but I wanna say thank you for hanging in there and listening to episode 130 of the Pharmacist Voice podcast. Please visit thepharmacistvoice.com to read the show notes. If you liked this episode, share it with a friend and subscribe to or follow the Pharmacist Voice podcast in your favorite podcast player to get each new episode delivered to your smartphone every time a new episode comes out. Thank you again for listening. Hey, Thanks for sticking around after the episode. This is a little bonus just for people who stick around to the end. In the beginning of the episode, I talked about how one plus one equals four being something I could relate to as a special needs parent. This is something that special needs parents will appreciate, and I just want to share it with all parents and all pharmacists, too, in case it helps you. As a special needs parent, one plus one equals four means I have had to find people that I trust and listen to them. And as a group with a speech therapist, with an occupational therapist, with certain special ed teachers, I have learned, this is kind of hard to say because it was a lesson hard one, I have learned that if we work together, we can help my son better but I still have to vet people. I still have to find the people that I trust before I listen to them. So I would encourage you, whether you're a special needs parent, a typical kid parent, or just a pharmacist, maybe who wants to be a parent someday, there will be things in your life where you will know what I am talking about, where you working with somebody else, you joining your horse with somebody else's horse and pulling the wagon together will accomplish more 
than you each pulling a wagon separately. I want you to really think about that. It goes for being a special needs parent. It goes for being a pharmacist. It goes for being a human in life. Find people you trust and listen to them. And if you don't speak the language that they speak, find an advocate, find a liaison, learn. Just because you don't understand doesn't mean that the person on the benefit end, your child, your patient, whatever, needs to suffer. Learn to speak somebody else's language. You'll benefit from it. This has been an unexpected lesson from the Pharmacist Voice podcast. One plus one equals four in many ways. I hope that you have much success and figure out how to attach your horse to somebody else and kick some ass out there in the field. Go get them.